So, hi, and welcome to the Midlife Momentum Podcast. So today I have a very special guest with me. Her name is Allegra Houston. She is the co-founder of the Imaginative Storm Writing Method and a co-author of the book and online course called Write What You Don't Know. She's also written and co-written several other books, including her beautifully written memoir, Love Child. She teaches a five-day memoir writing course in various locations, including most recently in our Canadian province uh, of Nova Scotia. And Allegra also happens to have grown up with two wonderful fathers, her film director father, John Houston, as well as her father, John Julius Norwich. And she's now living in beautiful Taos, New Mexico, in an adobe house she built with her, with the father of her son. And there's so much more I could say about Allegra, but I'll let her speak for now. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to her. So welcome to the podcast, Allegra. Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being here. And so I was particularly interested in you because you do write memoirs. And I know that's, uh, or you have written a beautiful memoir. And I was just curious about, because I have an audience of women who are midlife. And a lot of them are aspiring to write their own memoirs or to write creatively in some way. And I know this is the work that you do. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do and, and how it could, how maybe it could impact women in midlife and how they, they could write their own works? Well, um, I've been teaching writing workshops with my creative collaborator, James Nave, for, I guess, over 20 years now. And when I started, I had no idea what I was doing um, because my background is, um, you know, very kind of literary. I got through my childhood by reading every classic novel. I have a first in English from Oxford. I became editorial director of a publishing company. So I really thought I knew what good writing was. And um, then I, I was writing like magazine articles and they were okay. I could kind of, you know, get something for, you know, a thousand or 1500 words that was all right. But I then decided to write a memoir. And when I sat down to write it, I hated everything I wrote because it all sounded so stiff and pompous and, um, and I didn't know where to start. And, and I really had, no, but I had already started teaching writing workshops, quite ridiculous. Um, with Nave, um, we all call him Nave, <clears throat> excuse me, who had, when I met him, been working with Julia Cameron, the author of The Artist's Way, which probably many of your listeners will know, um, they had been de they had developed together and were teaching Artist's Way creativity camps. So this is just in aid of saying that the writing method, Imaginative Storm, which Nave and I developed together, I think is unique in that it has this um, this very mixed parentage. This DNA that comes both from, you know, classic novels, degree in English, editorial director, um, you know, a very critical, a very judgmental, a very kind of regimented, if you like, approach to what good writing is. And Nave's tradition in creativity work, and also he grew up in uh, Western North Carolina among, you know, old time storytellers and, and th that oral tradition. He was also a, a leading light of the poetry slam in its sort of first wave. So this has come together and I'm passionate about this method because I know it works, it worked for me. <laughs> As I said, when I sat down to write a memoir, I realized that for all I thought I knew, I really did not know how to do this. I did not know how to write well. And it took me some time to understand that two of my problems were that I was trying to write well, which I think is the enemy of actually writing well. And I was trying to write what I knew because I knew quite a lot. <laughs> um, and I knew obviously about my life. But when I tried to write down what I knew, it was kind of stale and flat and lifeless on the page. So that was how I came to understand that I was better off writing what I didn't know. And that then became the title of our book, Write What You Don't Know, 
Um, there, it's a very famous piece of writing advice, write what you know. I think it was from Hemingway, which is kind of fine as far as it goes. You know, you're writing about your life. Obviously, you know what happened. Um, you're, you're a plumber or a rocket scientist or a falconer, write about falconry or rocket science or plumbing. Great. But it only takes you so far. And in order to get life and originality and interest, your own interest, to be interested in your own writing, to get that onto the page, you have to write what you don't know. In other words, you have to approach what you know from an unexpected angle that you don't have a ready answer for. And this is what engages your curiosity, your imagination. This is where the fresh and original writing comes from, but it's also where the pleasure and the joy and the exploration and the discovery comes from. If you're only writing what you know, it's just a, a chore, mm. you know, and you have to be determined to do it. And I find that a lot of people, um, most of the people who take our writing workshops are writing memoir or wanting to write a memoir. And most of them have run up against the similar problems that I ran up against of not being able to get what's in their head onto the page, because actually it's not really in your head. So they're trying to write well, they're trying to write what they know, and it's become a chore. And when, when it becomes a chore and you have to, you know, pull yourself together and be determined and do this and sit down and force yourself, A, it's not fun. <laughs> B, this is the source of writer's block because you don't want to do it. So of course you're blocked. It's not enjoyable and you're not satisfied or interested by what you write. And if you're not interested and surprised, your writer, your reader certainly isn't going to be. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of perfect storm of problems, which all arise from these two central efforts, mis mistaken efforts that basically no, nobody tells you, don't do this. Don't try and write well. Don't write what you know or write what you know, but approach it from a not knowing sort of angle. And once you start doing that, then everything becomes easier. Everything becomes more enjoyable your writing becomes better because it's fresher. You're not trying to write well, which probably means you're trying to write like something you think was written well, which by definition means somebody else wrote it. So of course it doesn't sound like you, duh, right? So it's actually, it's a kind of amazing thing to me that in all my time, nobody ever taught me this. I had to figure it out on my own. Um, but having figured it out on my own, if, if good, if writing really brilliantly, like, you know, Salman Rushdie or Louise Erdrich or whoever it is, came naturally to me, I wouldn't be much use to anybody. You know, this is why I don't really like Stephen King's book on writing, because he obviously finds it so easy that basically he just says, you know, get yourself a desk and don't write badly. Well, you know, okay, thanks, Stephen, got that. But how do I, you know, I know how to get myself a desk. But that's a whole other question. I actually don't necessarily believe in, in even that part of his, his advice. Um, but when you've gone through it yourself, when you've tried to do something and been frustrated by not being able to do it, but finally found a way to do it, then it's really exciting to share that with other people. And so that's what I do now. That's what the imaginative storm is. That's what the book and the course of Write What You Don't Know are, are for, you know, I just want to kind of get them out there and, and save other people the sort of angst and struggle and frustration that I went through for years, or maybe they've already gone through it for years, but Hey, I can get you out of it. You can help. You can help. You can help. And you can even me, because I completely relate to the things you're saying. I have written blog posts for several years and now I'm, I'm doing this podcast. Um, and it's just, it's a lot of writing, but sometimes, yes, I'm, I'm telling what I know, but sometimes it's really hard because it's like, it's flat. Like you said, it's flat. How do you make it interesting? And I just love the idea of writing what you don't know. It's like the, it is the complete opposite of what we've been told. It's, you know, you think it naturally, of course, you're going to write what you know. And like you said, if you're writing about your life, 
it's something you feel like you know about, but evidently you wrote a memoir and you struggled having to write your memoir because you didn't remember everything and you had to figure that out as you sat down you realized I don't know everything I don't remember it and when I the things I do write down are flat so you had to go and find this process so what is the process what are some of the pieces that we need to to use to be able to to write better <laughs> without trying to write well without right trying to write well <laughs> well um I have a couple of basically really simple hacks. Okay. Um, the first one is, you know, don't try and write well. So throw away writing, it, which doesn't mean you're going to throw it away, but to be prepared to not use it. You're not, this is, you're not writing the book. So this is number one hack is don't write. Because if you're trying, if you're writing, it's really hard to not try and write well. So I don't write. I generate material, mm. generating material. I'm not writing, so I don't have to try and write well. I just want to generate material well. And I know how to generate material well, which is, hey, don't try to write well, um, but to surprise myself, to try and take my rational mind by surprise with kind of funny questions, like what wasn't there? Or what don't I remember? Or, okay, what was damaged? Mm. Or what was blue? You know, anything like that. Or, you know, what really annoyed me about that person? Or what was the most strange thing about the way that person walked? Mm. Or any, any question like that. It really actually doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's something you haven't really thought about before. Yeah. So that's, that's, and so when you're generating material in that way and not writing the book, you know, you're not going to use in the final draft, everything you come up with at this moment, but you're going to get something interesting, which you can then embed in, you know, rather more kind of prosaic or whatever, you know, in, in the joining up parts, basically you get the good bits and then you join them up. It's kind yeah. of like a quilt or like that, quilt. that's. Yeah, that's that's my way of going about it. So I generate material, as much material as I possibly can. And I had to learn this because when I started writing my memoir, I thought I had to start at the beginning, but I didn't know where the beginning was. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very frustrating. So I then realized, well, actually, my best tactic, if I'm not going to give up right now, is start anywhere that's absolutely not the beginning. And then I won't be distracted by trying to make it the beginning. <laughs> So jump around, jump around in your story, write about this scene, write about that scene, let your imagination make the connections between, you know, what happened when you were 20 and what happened when you were 42. If there is a kid, and what happened when you were six, if there's something that reminds you, oh, we were at the beach, there was this other time we were at the beach and I found this, this coin. And then there was this other coin that came to me, you know, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Um, but let your imagination take the lead. And I find that the two best ways to make that happen are by setting a 10 minute timer. Yeah. And I just did that on my phone and I generated all the material for both my memoir and my novel pretty much in 10 minute bursts. Mm. You just set, set the timer again, another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes. And the great thing about 10 minutes is your rational mind thinks, well, how can you possibly write anything good in 10 minutes? It's ridiculous. So it doesn't try so hard. It knows it's just generating material. So it's it's a sort of relief from the effort of trying to write well when you just have a 10 minute timer. I find that 20 minutes doesn't work so well because 20 minutes, you ought to be able to write something pretty good. So, mm -hmm. uh-oh, okay, <laughs> forget it. Um, so the 10 minute timer and writing by hand. Now, a lot of people think writing by hand is laborious, which, since we most of us are pretty good typists by now, is more laborious. That's true. It does tend to slow you down, but it has a lot of advantages. The first one is that um, it's messy. Mm. So you're not so tempted to go back and change things. 
when it's on a computer screen, it all looks so neat and tidy and it's so easy. You just, you can't help but read back over what you wrote and that's not that good. And you can't help but go back and change it because it's so easy to do. And before you know it, you're in your editing rational mind, not in your generative, creative, imaginative mind. Now you lose your momentum. Now you think this sucks. I can't write. Why am I doing this? I'm going to go wash the dishes. And that's what happens when you write on a computer, when you're generating material. But if you're writing in, you know, a cheap spiral notebook, yeah. if you write in a really nice notebook, and people are always giving me nice blank notebooks that I can't use because they make me want to write well. You know, I don't want to mess up the notebook by writing badly in it, but you don't want to have to live up to your notebook. So just buy a cheap notebook and write by hand in it. <laughs> I and, love that. Right? I, I am guilty of that too. I've got beautiful journals that I could write in, but I don't dare because yeah, you don't want to put your sloppy thoughts and incomplete ideas no. in there, right? No, they're intimidating. They make yeah. you feel like you're, then there are a lot of things that make you feel like you ought to be writing well. And I'll digress back to Stephen King and his, you know, get, make sure you have a place where you go and write doesn't work for me it makes me feel like I have to write well to justify having this whole desk set up or this room you know with all these books you know I set up a really nice writing room but all these books were behind me all these great writers were kind of peering over my shoulder and going oh well that's not very good is it um, or I would look up at the shelf and I'd see all these bound hardback books or paperback books and be reminded of how what that's what I wanted. And I had to write well in order to have that. So that mm. none of that helped. Coffee shops, totally recommend quiet library-ish coffee shops. Um, so I've completely, oh yes, writing by hand. So of course you can take your spiral bound notebook anywhere. You can go sit mm. under a tree in the forest if you want. Um, and when you write by hand, you're not tempted to go back and correct things because it gets so messy so quickly, you, there isn't really enough space. So you're just like, oh, whatever, and you carry on. So that in the end generates better material. The other thing I love about it is it makes you much more emotionally connected to your writing. Because, mm. and this is something that one of the people in our weekly prompt of the week session told me, um, there are pressure points on the outside of your hand that connect to your heart. And those nerves on the outside of your hand are stimulated when you write by hand because they very, um, that the side of your hand sort of slightly brushes the paper, brushes against the paper. And so A, you're connecting your hand to your heart. So what you write tends to be a lot more emotionally connected. Also, I think that it brings up a sort of bodily memory of being a child and drawing with crayons you know on pieces of paper probably sitting on the floor and being immersed in that creative flow the way we've all seen you know three-year-olds be immersed and I do think the body remembers that and there is a you know a suggestion of that that comes up when the outside of your hand brushes against paper so it's much easier for you. There's another reason that it's easier for you to get into that creative flowing, you know, state of mind rather than your adult, grown up, rational, critical, judging, ambitious, anxious, fearful mind. So good. I, I love that idea. I, I love writing by hand myself. But of course, yes, you think, oh, well, to save time, I'll, I'll do it on the computer because then I won't have to recopy it and and that. But there's something so satisfying. I do love writing by hand, something like you said, it it is a physical, maybe heartfelt experience in your, you feel it. And um, so I just, I love that idea. So I will, I will continue to do that. And the 10 minutes 
at a time. I think that is super important too. I have actually another friend who's an author who also said the same thing. He does oh, really? minutes at a yeah. time. That's how he writes his books. And so I'm like, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it sounds kind of silly. Like how can you write a book by just writing for 10 minutes at a time? But you can write for three or four or five, 10 minutes is all in a row if you want. And the nice thing about it too, is that if you're really kind of not getting somewhere with a particular scene or you know whatever it is that you're writing, when the timer goes off, that gives you permission to just change over. Okay, I'm going to go somewhere completely different. But when you don't have that timer, you sit there for you know the hour that you've allotted yourself in this coffee shop or whatever, um, and you struggle and struggle and struggle with the same thing mm -hmm. because you think like, well, this is what I'm doing. I ought to be able to get it. But that that 10 minute timer is, is sort of get out of jail free card too yeah. so you can, it allows you it helps you to hop around it helps you to be fresh and and then you do have to kind of you know you do have to go back later and type it up and if your handwriting is if you're one of those people who finds your handwriting hard to read you probably want to type it up later that day before you can't read it anymore yeah but I find that when you do that you're in a then a slightly different kind of flow mm -hmm. and you tend to edit a little bit as you type, but not so much in your critical mind, but it just sort of comes mm -hmm. because you're revisiting what you've written at, you know, from in, in the same, you know, it, 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 it's like if you're on a river, you know, sometimes when you're writing, you end up kind of over in an eddy and you've got to kind of push yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you retype it, you kind of notice yourself going into that eddy. And so you can kind of change it a little bit and keep it going. And then what I did is I had all these separate typed up bits and I just laid them out all over the floor. You know, most of them were a page long or maybe two pages at most double spaced and, um, and went, walked around the room and sort of picked them up in what felt like the right order because a memoir doesn't have to be chronological. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that was a big problem for me because I, for some reason thought it did have to be. Um, yeah. And I, that's why I couldn't figure out where to start because I wasn't starting at the beginning of the story. I was starting chronologically. But when I realized that I didn't have to go chronologically, that, you know, where does the story start? And I can, we can re revisit that question. Um, you can then just walk around and kind of instinctively put it in an order. And then what I did is I, retype the whole thing everybody's going to think oh she's crazy this is so laborious talk about not you know as you never heard of copy and paste <laughs> but when you copy and paste you're not in the flow of the story no if you retype it you can still be in the flow of the story and you know oh wait a minute that actually isn't what comes next or oh it feels like there's a jump here there's a gap i need i need to generate some more material for that bit so my recommendation is hone your storytelling instincts rather than your storytelling judgment. Mm. Use your instinctive faculties rather than your critical faculties. And you can do that very easily. You know, you can start by understanding things about like, you know, what's, what's a beginning or an ending? What's the disturbance of an equilibrium? What's an obstacle? What's conflict? You know, these are, you know, what's a turning point? You, you, you can understand these things, but the goal of our book and course, right, what you don't know, is to give people an instinctive understanding of those things so that you can feel this feels right or this doesn't feel right. And when you think this doesn't feel right, you're curious, why doesn't it? And you're motivated to do something differently. But the exact same thought from your critical mind, this isn't right, makes you want to give up and say, I'm not a good writer. Mm. And it's the same judgment is just coming from a different kind of place. Yeah. So, it you know, it all curious. Yeah. It sounds like curiosity. Makes up together yeah. Because you know, one of the other things we say is, you know, retrain your inner critic into your inner coach. Your rational mind is, is critical. 
you know, you did this badly, you did this wrong. And it's a very short jump to you're a lousy writer. Why are you even bothering? Um, but nobody hires a tennis critic. Nobody hires a tennis, a business critic. You hire a coach. And what is the difference? A coach builds on your strengths. A coach tells you what you're doing well. A coach sees what's good about what you're doing and praises you for it. So you're motivated to carry on doing that. And most of us don't praise ourselves. And most of us don't notice what we're doing well. We're more focused on bad writing than good writing. But when you're generating material and you're not trying to write, <laughs> you focus, you know, what, what's not good or not alive, not interesting, just doesn't matter. Because mm -hmm. you only spent 10 minutes, so big deal. You know, wow, you wasted a whole 10 minutes if you didn't get anything. But if you got one little image, one combination of words where you go, ooh, I actually kind of like that. Mm -hmm. What a triumph. There yeah. is a 10 minutes very well spent. And you're retraining your inner critic into your inner coach along the way. Yeah. Which, of course, you know, relates to your whole life. Because yeah, I love that same, that concept, the concept. inner coach instead of the inner critic. That is so so good. I I think about that because yeah, not just in relation to writing, but in in every part of our lives. I know that I deal with women who want to feel better in their bodies, want to be more fit, want to be more healthy, and they're very self-critical about their bodies, about themselves. And if they could turn that around and be a coach instead and just see what is good about me, what is good about my body, um, can I do 10 minutes of exercise instead of an hour of exercise? Can I just do 10 minutes and do it badly and, and just, but say I, I actually showed up for myself. Uh, I think those are so, those concepts are so applicable to so many other areas of our lives. Yeah, 10, 10 minutes, I think is it's the key to so many things because it really doesn't seem like a long time. And you kind of feel like you can put up with an awful lot for just 10 minutes. And, you know, and then if you can make it fun, you know, so much the better. We find that a lot of the people that come to our weekly um, prompt of the week session and, you know, your listeners are totally invited to come. It's open to everyone in the world. There's actually a guy in Rwanda that found us and zooms in sometimes awesome. and a guy in South Africa. And um, so and a number of people in Canada, um, one of a, a number of the people in that uh, weekly group, and we've been doing it for almost three years now don't come anymore because they actually want to write anything. And some of them, you know, just came because like their girlfriends or wives or husbands or whatever, you know, said, oh, you should come. They come because they find that it actually does improve the quality of their life. You know, be on this, um, you know, inner critic, inner coach idea, um, they find that they're easier on themselves. They're more, um, you know, more able to to accept the, and praise themselves for something they've done well they also find that they're just simply more aware of the beauty and the nuance in the world around them uh, they find that their range of compassion extends because they're also hearing what other people have written we read everything we write aloud um because it you know we only wrote it in 10 minutes it's not very long yeah. um, and so you hear what other people write and you share what you write and it's a wonderful kind of celebration of humanity mm. it sounds very grand and i'm sorry i don't mean to sound quite so <laughs> grand but that really is what it is um now that i'm thinking about it that phrase just came out that it wasn't you know that, that was not one i prepared earlier um so Yes, you just, you know, it's it's a wonderful practice to have a weekly practice. And I never had one until almost three years ago when we started this weekly practice. But I find that it's so nurturing to the spirit. It's also good for the writing because the more throwaway writing you do, the less attached you are to whatever you write when you sit down to write something, you know, that your real work. Um, but it really is, it's, I look forward to it. It's fun. It's a creative practice. And 
you know, every happiness researcher in the world will say that one of the top ingredients to happiness is having a creative practice. I've certainly found that. Yes, absolutely. I just think it's such a unique idea and such an opportunity to be able to sit there with so many other people who are also just sitting there for 10 minutes and writing, but completely different things about the same image. I believe you show an image, right? And then you write for 10 minutes. And then... Yes, we, it's usually an image. Sometimes it's an audio or a video. And we all generate a random list of words. And then we share a word from our list and we create a community list. And then we, we're not looking at the image anymore. And then we write whatever we want. But we have two lists of words. So maybe 50 or 60 words, which are basically just toys. It's like a sandbox. Those are just toys in the sandbox. And you can use them or not use them as you like. Yeah. And very often, you know, those they're weird combinations of words in there, like, you know, ironic potatoes was one that just came up a couple of <laughs> weeks ago. And I thought, OK, I wonder what ironic potatoes would be. And I just had a really nice time writing for 10 minutes about this, you know, international UN buffet with the ironic potatoes in it. But um, <laughs> and things like that playfulness which you can develop when you're not working on your real project, then, you know, um, comes through when you are working on your real project. Mm. But also as you write, you know, playfully throw away nonsense stuff, sometimes you'll get a phrase or an image in there and you're like, oh, I can use that, you know, okay. I'm, I'm picking that one out and putting it in the file for the real, the real project. You yes, know, it's yes. you, it's original, it's your voice. You don't have to go and find your voice is the other sort of great writer problem, you know, writer's block, inner critic, find your voice. It's there. You just have to let it come out and hear it and appreciate it and not try and write like what you think good writing is that was written by somebody else. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's all it's all very simply connected, but amazingly, I, I don't know that anybody else has put it together in quite the way that Nave and I have, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and kind of put it out there. You know, there are other really good books like, you know, Natalie Goldberg writing down the bones, but she doesn't have any writing exercises. She doesn't have prompts. She has advice and inspiration. We have a, an actual training course. That was the idea. We think of it as writer training, like going to the gym for writing. So you're training. So, okay, you can go to the gym and look at all these machines, but somebody has got to tell you what to do. So that's what the Write What You Don't Know course does. It gives you these ideas or these machines, these strategies, these techniques, this method, and actually takes you through 10 sessions of using them okay. and by the end of those 10 sessions you've written to you know roughly 60 prompts 61 or two and um, you have a lot of material at this point wow. and you probably know where your memoir or novel whatever it is is going to go and it may well not be quite what you thought it was at the beginning hmm. it's a lot more interesting too now it's like a fun Absolutely. project Absolutely, not a chore so this is 10 sessions. Is it with a group as well? Is this, how does that work? The well, um, the book, you know, there's a book and there's a self-paced online course. Okay. So okay. those obviously are, um, don't come with a pre-made group, but mm -hmm. I would totally recommend people to put together a little group, even just two or three people and do it in a group because I think there's a great benefit to that. Um, if you buy the online course, you get, um, it includes a once a month Zoom for ever and ever, as long as we're, you know, breathing uh, with me and Nave. So you will get somewhat more of the group experience. And we also have um, a platform online called The Circle, where you can post what you write to each of the prompts. And also in the online course, we have what we call a prompt archive. So you can hear between three and five people 
reading what they wrote in 10 minutes to each of the prompts you're working with. So we've done the best that we can to give solo people a group experience in that. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. That's so but, wonderful. So much support in that. Well, that's the goal because it is, you know, it can be lonely. Yeah. Um, we have one prompt, which I really like. Um, it's in the in the prompt about kind of social life called social ease. And the prompt is about initiation into a tribe. See, we ask people to think of all the different tribes that they have or do belong to. And some tribes aren't necessarily all in the same place. So writers are a tribe. But and like birders are a tribe, but most birders do their bird watching in parties of one. Mm -hmm. And many writers do their writing in parties of one, but it feels good to belong to that tribe. So we invite, you know, everyone who wants to, to work with us, whether it's virtually or just in a book or however, to, you know, to kind of join our tribe. And then we do, you know, live in-person workshops as well. Um, the next one is in Taos, New Mexico, where I live in April, end of April. And in fact, um, last weekend, I had somebody sign up who I've never met or spoken to or anything, emailed anything in my life, just suddenly out of nowhere, she signed up to come to Taos and work with us in person because she loves the book. Okay, well, there a you friend, go. A, yeah. a mutual friend had given her, um, had given her our book. And so now she's coming to work with us in person and it will be the same in, in Nova Scotia. I'll be in Nova Scotia again next October um, doing the five day memoir intensive. And many of those people um, have last year had, had never worked with me at all. Mm -hmm. A couple of them had found us online and came, you know, weekly to the zoom session one of them had done my memoir workshop a few years previously in Mallorca and wanted to come back. So, you know, there's always a, a range of people. Some people actually aren't working on memoir at all, but they know that there's going to be a memoir component. You know, they're writing, they're fictionalizing, or maybe you're writing a, a book of what's called well, I don't know, what is it called now? The name's gone out of my head, but like, you know, sort of like self-help, you know, type of nonfiction, but based on your experience. Yes. So of course that has a very large memoir component and you want those stories about your life or other people's lives as they've gone through whatever this transformation might be. You want them to be, you know, emotionally compelling to a reader. That's the whole point. Okay. So working with memoir, I think is, you know, pretty much covers almost all prose writing and poetry as well. Screenplay, not so much. I'm a screenwriter as well. Um, but I do think that the Write What You Don't Know project um, works very well for screenwriters. In fact, the woman who signed up that I'd never met in my life, she's a screenwriter. Um, and, and so am I, and there, a lot of the prompts are very good for dialogue and character and, and also mm. you know, story narrative structure. Yeah. So, I mean, it does cover so many different types of writing. You're able, if, if you can tap into your imagination, which is, I think what the whole point is, right? So you it's get rid the of the critic and so you can tap into your imagination and come up with things that you never even imagined you could. Well, another one of those pieces of writing advice that I think is has not been super helpful for a lot of people, like write what you know. Um, the other one is get out of your rational mind. Mm. Now, maybe somebody has actually managed to do that. <laughs> I tried and failed <laughs> um, and felt like a failure. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to be able to do this, but I'm actually a very... Uh, left brain, I think it is left brain person. I'm a very, you know, rational academic type of person. I like to do things right. I'm kind of a perfectionist. I'm a Virgo. Mm -hmm. um, so I couldn't get out of my rational mind. It's like, uh, no, it's there. So, you know, but it's not, you, I don't think you can. It's not like, you know, taking off a pair of shoes. So what we say is let your rational mind and your imagination dance together. Mm -hmm. But if your imagination is the partner leading the dance, 
what's the job of your rational mind? It wants a job. It's yeah. there, you know, it wants to know what it's supposed to do. Well, it's supposed to follow. And if you've ever done partner dancing, you know that following is actually pretty challenging. Mm-hmm. And you know, as we all know, Ginger Rogers did it backwards and in, in high heels, right? Um, so if your rational mind's job is to follow and it's allowing your imagination to twirl it around and make it dizzy and spin it and dip it and twirl it out of rationality. But its job is to let that happen. It's only for 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. It can do it for 10 minutes. So its job is to not give up, to not collapse on the floor, to not storm off in a pet and say, oh, this isn't working. I don't like it. Just to hang in there for 10 minutes. Mm. So the more that you, you know, start that music playing, the more you get that dance going, just like with all dancing, the better your rational mind gets at following. And it's not used to that. And you know that if you're a controlling type of person, as I am, it can be, it's very hard to follow if you're doing that kind of dancing. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I think it's a really useful metaphor for getting your rational mind to give up control. Mm. Just 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. I think, and, and it's exactly that. It's just practice. Like everything else, it's just taking the time, taking 10 minutes at a time, just practicing and you will get better. It's like yeah, it's building you will. any other strength or any other muscle. It, it's the same thing. You just need to keep trying it. Yeah, um, it's we, we say you stretch and strengthen your imagination. Mm. Just like going to the gym, you stretch and strengthen your muscles. Now you're just stretching and strengthening your imaginative muscles. Yeah. And yeah, there are people who are, you know, natural born writers and this just all comes to them without even thinking. And I think I would say Stephen King is one of those people, you know, good for him. But writers aren't this sort of, you know, special breed anointed by the gods. You know, we can pretty much everybody, and I've, as I say, been teaching writing workshops for over 20 years. Everybody can write something that surprises them, that satisfies them, even that amazes them in 10 minutes. Can everybody write a full length book really well? Maybe not, but more people can than they would think so. As as long as you don't, you know, sit down and start trying to write the book. That's that's the part that doesn't work. You have the intention, the overall goal of writing the book, but when you sit down, just generate material. Yeah. And then you can edit it, rewrite it, and you're never writing at all. (laughs) No, but I just think this is so valuable because I do meet a lot of women in midlife. You know, we've had a life. We've 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 lived half, you know, possibly half of our lives, possibly more. um, That you know, we want to write about it. We want we have a story to tell. We have things we want to say. But how do you do it? And how do you make it interesting? And and that's what you provide is this process, this way of doing it, that we can get things out that we never would have even thought were possible out of our minds. I'm sure when you wrote your memoir, it was like that, where you came up with things as like, wow, I didn't even know that was there. Mm-hmm. And it showed up. Yeah. So funny. Absolutely. And the other thing about writing, um, writing about your life is, It's a wonderful way to make sense of your life. Mm. You know, it's a wonderful way to to explore into, oh, that's what I was doing. You know, why was I with that guy? I mean, what was I thinking? And, you know, maybe it, it, you know, you start to get insights into yourself, the people around you, um, you know, human nature that you just, don't get without that exploratory writing what you don't know approach. So it's, I mean, yes, it's therapeutic, but without having to be therapy-ish. Yeah. I think it's good, you know, therapeutic just basically means it's good for you. I think it is good for you. I think it's very good for you. And 
you know, that's why we all read, why we read, why we love stories, because they give us ways of understanding who we are in the world, why we do what we do, how we, how we make it through all of the, you know, tough stuff that life throws at us. And writing about your life is just, a, a, to me, the best way to, you know, gain that insight without being judgmental, without going, oh, that was wrong, but being compassionate to yourself, but also clear and honest. And the lovely thing about when you get those kind of insights and you're not coming at it in a what's wrong with me sort of way mm -hmm. is that you get, you get those insights and they're funny. And you're like, oh, okay, you know, wow, that's what I was doing there. Oh, dear, you know, but you're, as if you're amused, mm -hmm. again, it's motivating, like curiosity is motivating. And you, I don't think you can be amused and critical at the same time. And I don't think you can be curious and critical at the same time. So the more you amuse yourself and are curious, give yourself new things to explore the again your inner critic just you know quiets down and its job it learns that its job is different it learns yeah. that its job is to remind you to set the 10 minute timer to remind you to let your imagination take the lead you know if there are a lot of useful jobs you can give it it's like a sheepdog you know if it doesn't have sheep to herd it's going to chase cars but give it some sheep that's and then it'll be totally happy and it won't chase the cars that you don't want it to chase. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just want to thank you for inviting us to, to kind of be children here and to play and to use our imaginations. And I think we become adults and we forget to use these tools, these faculties that we have. We all mm -hmm. have access to these things. They didn't go anywhere. It's just that we kind of push them away because they didn't seem important, but I just love that this approach is totally about embracing that part of ourselves. And, uh, and I just think it's so important and it's, it's so welcoming. It's so um, warm. I don't know what it is, but there's something so beautiful <laughs> about it. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to thank you for that because I do obviously deal with women in midlife and I love the idea of having them go back it's you, you have everything within you. It's within you already. You have an imagination. You have exactly. this faculty within you to tap into to, and it can change your life in so many ways. If you want to become a writer, that's one way, but there's so many ways you can use this. And um, I love that. And, and I just want to ask before we wrap up, there's a question I always ask my guests is what for you has been the best part of getting older? not caring so much about what other people think of me mm -hmm. would be one but maybe and i you you did tell me the question in advance and i very deliberately didn't want to come up with a sort of free <laughs> pre-cooked answer so i think the main thing actually probably is feeling don't like the word entitled. I wish I could come up with a better word. Um, feeling comfortable at the center of my own life. Not feeling that my job is to be a supporting character in other people's lives. Feeling that it's okay for me to be the leading character in my life. And that that's my story. I'm not living somebody else's story. I'm not just somebody's daughter or sister or mother or wife or whatever. Yes, I am those things. But that does not take precedence over me at the center of my own life. I mean, you know, I believe we only get one. And it's ours. Your life is yours. My life is mine. I don't, I can share it, but I don't need to give it away. No, no, that's so beautiful. 
that we should all be the main character in our own lives is something I think we should all aspire to. And to I realized after I wrote it that that actually is the sub the story of my memoir of Love Child. It is, yeah, because it's your recollection. It's your story within the stories of others. I'm sure they have their own stories, but it's you in that in the midst of all that, right? And I grew up feeling like the least important person in the room. You know, I definitely grew up feeling that my role was to be the supporting character in other people's lives. Yeah. yeah. So it was, and I didn't know when I set set out to write that book um, and then to generate the material for it, I didn't know that that would be one of the major themes of it that only came through later. So, you know, there's another piece of piece of advice. Don't, don't sort of rationally think it all through too much before you start, let it, let it arise. Yeah. Don't think of the title before you write the book. Yeah, exactly. Generate the material <laughs> for the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, this was really great. Allegra, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today and if any of the women in my audience want to learn more about you or want to find you, how can they do that? They can find me through imaginativestorm.com. They can also find me through my website, allegrahouston.com. And you can just email me. I'm allegra at imaginativestorm.com. I make myself very easy to find. We are instituting a new prompt of the week session now on Thursday afternoons at what will be 6 p.m. Eastern time. And um, if you would like to come, just you know, join our mailing list and you will have your invitation. I love that. Thanks for the invitation. And I will include all of your links and uh, your email address in the show notes so that anybody who wants to can get in touch with Allegra. And uh, I just want to again, thank you so much for being here today. This was so enlightening. So beautiful. I love talking to you. Thank you, Allegra. Well, thank you, Debbie. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. All right.